If you were trapped in a mold-infested mystery mansion of death with a family of insane swamp criminals trying to hunt you down, what would you do? Please keep both hands safely inside the vehicle as we break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the bakers in Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. <laughs> Ethan Winters has been having some relationship troubles, and they're not the kind that you can fix with couples therapy. It's been three years since Ethan's wife, Mia, suddenly disappeared without a trace, until a few nights ago, when he received a plea for help simply reading Dulve, Louisiana, Baker Farm, Come Get Me, which is definitely not suspicious or vaguely threatening in any way. Being the loyal husband that he is, Ethan immediately drops everything and drives out to the remote property in the exact car from the Evil Dead, carrying nothing but the clothes on his back and both of his hands still firmly attached to his body. Far out in the swamp, he arrives at Mia's surprise long-term Airbnb, the Baker Residence, and it's about to become his own personal hell. The large iron gate is locked, forcing Ethan to circle around down a muddy path until he finally comes to a dilapidated guest house, and the still smoking fire pit with Mia's purse buried in the ashes makes it clear that he's found the right place. Ethan cautiously explores further into the house, quickly noticing that the place is in a severe state of decay. There are no signs of life anywhere besides the roaches feasting on the rotting gumbo in the kitchen, until he finds a VHS tape labeled Derelict House Footage, which shows a group of ill-fated ghost hunters investigating the house for the next episode of their show, before they're all suddenly attacked and captured by a mysterious figure. After witnessing three men suffer a horrible death in this exact location just a few weeks ago, Ethan naturally decides to follow their path into the terrifying house's even more terrifying basement. Besides a surprise dead body, he makes it through the flooded hallways without any trouble and that's when he finally finds Mia locked in a cell. Easy enough, time to go home. But wait, there's a problem. She's terrified that someone called Daddy is coming and starts frantically leading Ethan back through the basement until she suddenly disappears while he's looking for a way out. Searching for the main floor again turns up nothing, forcing Ethan to circle back to the basement to investigate some creepy breathing sounds. The good news is that Mia's back. The bad news is that she's suddenly gone full grudge mode and wants to introduce Ethan to her new friend, Mr. Knife. Their family reunion quickly turns into an all-out death match. <laughs> With Ethan here being thrown through the walls like a ragdoll until he finally buries a hatchet into the side of his wife's neck. But wait, Mia's still alive. And she brought two more friends, Mr. Screwdriver and Mr. Chainsaw. Ethan manages to get free just as Bob the Builder here uses that chainsaw to chop his left hand completely off of his body. But she's feeling a little tired now and decides to go take a nap. With blood still squirting from his stump, Ethan retreats up to the attic where he finds a handgun and some ammo. Now we're talking. Just as he's about to escape through a window, Mia and her chainsaw crash the party again, but this time he's able to take her down with a healthy amount of lead. Ethan has now killed his wife twice in the same night, and he's probably wondering how things could get any worse which is when he's sucker punched and curb stomped by a six foot one, 240 pound, unkillable redneck named Jack. And boy, are things about to get so much worse. Okay, time for us to step in real quick because it looks like our buddy Ethan here could really use a hand, <laughs> get it? But for real, by the time his story is finally over, this guy is going to have enough hand trauma to give the Skywalkers a run for their money. And this is just the beginning. Now, to say that this rescue mission isn't going well would be an understatement. Any day that starts off with you wandering into an abandoned ghost house and ends with a size 12 boot on your forehead probably didn't go the way you had planned unless you have a very strange idea of a good time. Now, Mia isn't the only Winters who's MIA, and no one is coming to save them, which can only mean one thing, Ethan, my boy, you f***ed up. The truth is that this plan was botched from the start, since Ethan here decided to just rush in solo without telling anyone what was up, not even the police. 
Look, I understand the urgency to get his wife home safe, but seriously, what the hell was he thinking? In situations like this where emotions are high and you have every reason to believe that things could get dangerous, the most important thing to do is take a deep breath, step back, and approach the problem from a logical perspective. After all, I'm no detective, but it's my understanding that people who've just been missing for three freaking years usually don't just send you an email out of the blue with their exact coordinates. Since Ethan had absolutely no idea what happened to Mia or why, he should have guessed that blindly running to the rescue could easily put him in the same position, which is exactly what ended up happening. That's not to mention that Ethan is from Los Angeles, so whether he flies or drives, it's going to be a long trip to the middle of nowhere Louisiana, and the police could definitely have looked into things sooner if he'd just given them a heads up. The property is already on the police's radar, and now that they have an actual email from a missing person saying that she's there, that should give them enough of a reason to at least go check the place out. Let's just assume for whatever reason, Ethan didn't want to get the police involved yet. All right, but then why not at the very least tell some family or friends what's going on? It's a lot to ask, but maybe he's got a good friend back in LA who would have come with him. Everyone knows that there's safety in numbers, and plus, if you're exploring a ghost house, then it's always better to bring a meat shield along just in case things get weird, which, let's face it, they always do. Also, since Mia is only 29, it's reasonable to think that she should have some family still alive. Maybe she has a brother or dad who would have helped Ethan search for her too. It couldn't hurt to ask. And then let's talk about the house itself. Even without knowing about the 20 or more people who've gone missing around there over the years, just look at the place. It's the most textbook example of a haunted mansion that anyone's ever seen, with threatening messages and freaking meat sculptures literally around the first corner. Also, ask yourself this. Mia's been missing for three years. Why were the kidnappers just now getting around to burning her stuff? I'll tell you why, because it's a trap. They used her information to find Ethan, and one fake email later, here he comes walking right into his own funeral. Do you really think that these people would have the front gate chained shut, but then the back door just sitting wide open? Hello! You're about to be turned into Ethan Stew. It doesn't take Batman to figure this one out, but even when he had actual video evidence of what happened to the last guys who went snooping around there, he still didn't get the message until it was already much too late. Ethan started off with good intentions, but ended up breaking into a stranger's house, getting his hand chained sawed off, killing his wife twice, and getting captured by a cannibalistic swamp man. All in all, he's off to a pretty rough start, but the real nightmare has only just begun. Sorry, Ethan, but you f***ed up. The next thing Ethan knows, he wakes up at the family's kitchen table with his hand helpfully reattached. Since Mia was calling Jack here daddy, now it's time for Ethan to meet his new in-laws from hell. Besides the man of the house, there's his psychotic wife, Margaret. their even more sadistic son, Lucas, and the family's catatonic grandma, who just kind of hangs out. The theme for tonight's dinner is Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and they're enjoying a nice home-cooked meal of human intestines. Jack even uses a knife to play a game of Here Comes the Airplane with Ethan until they're rudely interrupted by a visit from the local authorities. This gives Ethan a chance to escape, but it isn't long before Jack returns and starts chasing after him with a shovel, crashing straight through walls like the Kool-Aid man if he turned to a life of cannibalism. Luckily, he's able to lose him in a crawl space under the house, throwing Jack off of his trail for now. Back in the hallway, Ethan's actually able to speak to the deputy through the boarded up door and they agree to meet each other out in the garage. Despite Ethan stressing that they need to leave now, the deputy questions him for just long enough that Jack has time to sneak up from behind and slice the man's head completely in half from the eye up. With the deputy down, Ethan scrambles to grab his Glock while Jack chases him around the garage. Thinking quickly, Ethan grabs the keys to his car and starts trying to run him over. But Jack responds by ripping the entire roof off, taking control of the wheel and driving them both straight into a pile of steel beams. Ethan escapes from the crash unharmed as the car goes up in flames. But Jack climbs out and starts walking towards him until the vehicle explodes, knocking him down. It's not over yet though, because just when Ethan turns his back, Jack grabs his weapon and finishes the job, finally taking himself out, at least for now. 
Man, talk about a splitting headache. Ethan may have been lucky enough to escape with his life, but he just lost the only backup that he had. On the bright side, at least it looks like Jack is out of the picture, for now anyway. Now, I don't know about you, but after everything that's just gone down, I'd officially be postponing this rescue mission and making my new top priority getting as far away from this house as physically possible. It might be hard to think straight with his adrenaline still pumping from the fight with Jack, but right now, the only thing separating Ethan and freedom is the garage door, so that's where I'd want to start. Let's start with the simplest solution and see where it takes us. At the beginning of the fight, Jack closed the door remotely before attacking the deputy, so I'd take a look around to see if I could find the button to open it again. Otherwise, every garage door has a way to manually open it, and that's what I'd be trying next. Now, maybe the mechanisms were damaged in the explosion and the door no longer works. Fair enough, but there's no reason why Ethan can't use his new Glock or a tool from the garage to try breaking one of the windows. The same thing goes for trying to bend the bottom of the door up just enough for him to crawl through, although he'll want to be quick so he doesn't run the risk of ending up like Tatum from Scream. The best part is that the deputy's squad car is still right on the other side of the door, so Ethan won't even have to walk back through the swamp to reach civilization. I'm sure the sheriff isn't going to like some random guy showing up in one of their vehicles with the new deputy nowhere in sight, but personally, I'd rather deal with the local authorities than the local cannibal any day of the week. Ethan should also try searching the deputy's body for anything else useful while he has the chance. If his radio still works, then Ethan can use it to call for help, which would be a huge win. Eventually, the other deputies are going to take notice that one of them went to the Baker house and never came back, so it can only be a matter of time before help is on the way. Ethan just has to survive long enough for them to get there if finding a way out isn't an option, but that's going to be easier said than done. Done. If he can't get out through the garage somehow, then going back into the house is unfortunately Ethan's only choice. It looks like Jack here is out of the picture, but if we learned anything from the fight with Mia, then we know that it's only a matter of time before he shows up again. And we need to have a plan for how we're going to handle it when he does. Like we mentioned before, Jack here is a force to be reckoned with. He's a six foot one, 240 pound former football player and Marine who's right at home here on the bayou. He obviously knows the layout of the house better than anyone and has a whole arsenal of terrifying weapons that I get the feeling he's been just waiting to use on a defenseless victim. Worst of all, his infection makes him super strong and impervious to damage. Even a shotgun blast to the face won't do the trick. In fact, he'll probably find it funny that you even tried, and that's about as terrifying as it gets. Because if your problem can't be solved with a shotgun, then you have a very big problem indeed. Then we have Ethan, our average built tech geek from LA who's probably never been in a fight in his life. Forget standing up to Jack, Ethan here can't even run away all that fast. The best thing that he has going for him is his inexplicable ability to reattach amputated limbs with the help of whatever miracle cure is in those bottles of strange green liquid that he keeps finding around the house. But if that's all we have to rely on, then I'm not feeling too great about his chances here. All things considered, Jack here would whoop Ethan's ass, even without his special powers. And I know who my money would be on if they had to fight. The only the only possible good news is that he must have brought Ethan to the house for a reason, which could mean that he isn't willing to kill him outright, but I sure as hell wouldn't take my chances finding out. It looks like the best option for now is to avoid confrontation at all costs until we can find a way out of there, which basically turns survival into a life or death game of hide and seek. Now personally, I wouldn't waste any time or ammo trying to fight Jack head on. Instead, the better strategy would be to just stay low and quiet whenever you can and use corners, furniture, and any hidden routes that you discover to navigate through the house without being detected. Be patient, stay calm, and listen for his heavy footsteps so that you'll always have an idea of where Jack is and where you don't want to be. I'd try to pay attention to his patterns and behaviors, like where he tends to look while searching a room or paths that he prefers to take throughout the house. If he needs to, Ethan 
could use something noisy, like one of the empty beer bottles that are all over the place, to distract Jack while he sneaks by. It's crucial to make a mental note of the house as you continue to explore, and try to remember what halls lead to which rooms, where the good hiding places are, any alternate paths to get around, and anywhere that it looks like it might have a promising chance to escape. You never know when Jack could come back, so you should always have a plan for where you'll go and what you'll do if he shows up. This isn't going to be easy, but if you don't want to end up being served as dinner to the next unlucky guy who wanders in here, then your only choice is to stay positive and keep pushing forward until you eventually find a way out of this madhouse. Now that Jack is out of the picture, Ethan finally makes it to the entrance hall of the main house. The door to freedom is right there, but it's locked with some kind of strange contraption, requiring him to find three statues to open it because, of course it does. With no other choice, Ethan continues exploring the creepy-ass house like he's trying to solve the world's most dangerous escape room. The search eventually leads him to the second floor, but as he finishes checking the bathroom, Ethan's suddenly ambushed by who else but Jack himself, somehow back from the dead once again, and he's even angrier than before. After narrowly avoiding being pulverized by Jack's new spiky rolling pin of death, Ethan discovers a hidden passageway through the walls down on the first floor, which leads him into another closed off section of the house. He's managed to lose Jack for now, but there's no telling when the big guy will show up again. It turns out that the bakers aren't the only threats in the house. As Ethan enters one of the next rooms, a giant, horrific creature suddenly emerges from the black mold growing up the walls. It's one of their previous victims that was somehow transformed by the mold into a shambling abomination with a craving for human flesh. Fortunately, these guys aren't as impervious to damage as the bakers are, and Ethan is able to take it down with a few well-placed shots. The hall eventually leads to another locked door, leaving Ethan with only one way to go, down a dimly lit staircase into the house's mold-infested basement. Okay, hold up, Ethan. Let me stop you right there. Creepy hallways and secret passages are one thing, but another basement? You can't be serious. We've seen what happens in this house's basements, and I'm telling you right now, there's no way that I'd be going down there unless I really had no other choice, especially now that we've encountered another type of enemy, these mutated abominations called the Molded. Ethan has no idea what these things are, at least not yet, but taking a good look at them, once they're safely taken down, of course, might give you a hint. Essentially, these guys are what comes out when the bakers feed one of their victims to the mold that's growing all over their house. Nasty. It looks like they're approaching seven feet tall with a gaping mouth full of massive teeth and long tentacle-like arms with huge claws on the end that can even grow into a shield to protect them from attacks. That's absolutely terrifying, but fortunately, unlike Jack and Mia, they can be taken down with enough damage. And the best way to do it is to stay out of their reach and aim for the head, just like the good old fashioned zombies that we all know and love. It takes a lot of damage to bring them down though, so personally, I'd still try my best to avoid a head-on fight and sneak my way around them if I could instead. After a few encounters, Ethan might also realize that they actually aren't smart enough to open doors, which is a big help because it gives you an easy way to escape as long as you can get out of the room. Also, there was a note back in the basement where he found Mia that listed off all of the baker's 20-something victims that have been converted into these creatures. Knowing this, I'd try to keep a mental tally of how many that I've been able to take out as I progressed through the house. That way, I'd at least have a rough estimate of how many could still be lurking in the shadows. Now, seeing this mold actually gives us a good idea of what's been causing the bakers and their experiments to go so crazy all along. In real life, exposure to black mold probably won't turn you into an unkillable mutant, but it can cause a number of bad health effects, including respiratory issues and allergic reactions. So knowing this, Ethan should minimize his exposure to the mold as much as possible. And if he happens to find any protective gloves, goggles, or masks lying around, I'd suggest throwing them on just to be safe. 
It's important to clean any mold that you find in your home, but in this case, I'd say just burn this whole madhouse down once Ethan and Mia get out of there. So now we have an idea of what we're up against, but if Ethan were to decide that the strange puzzles and insane killers were all just a bit too much, there's one other thing that I might try. Back in the main hall, there's a room with a shotgun that locks you in when you try to grab it. It could be possible to drag something heavy over to block the door, get the shotgun, and then just blast your way out of the house straight through the front door or any of the large windows that are around it, creating your own exit. It could definitely work better than going down into that basement, and Ethan needs to start thinking outside of the box if he's going to survive. The entire basement has been turned into a processing area for the baker's twisted experiments, and Ethan has to fight his way through as he's being ambushed by several more of the mold monsters from around every corner. But the good news is that while he was exploring, he found a shotgun. Deep within the tunnels, Ethan finally finds the last key suspiciously hanging right out in the open up on a raised walkway. But this time, when he grabs it, Jack suddenly attacks him from behind knocking Ethan down into a makeshift arena on the lower level. It's time for another fight, but this time Ethan won't be such a pushover. Using his new arsenal, he does enough damage that Jack tears open a fence and grabs a terrifying contraption made out of two huge chainsaws. But Ethan gets his hands on one of his own, that's right, it's time for a chainsaw duel, and Ethan dodges around the arena using the hanging bodies for cover, damaging Jack whenever he can, until finally he's able to drive the saw deep into his brain, causing the top half of his body to just straight up explode. Jack's legs get up and stumble forward on their own for a second, until he's finally dead, like really dead. And with a feeling of newfound confidence, Ethan uses the chainsaw one last time to open the path forward. Back in the entrance hall, Ethan's finally able to get the main door open with the third key. Victorious, he takes his first steps out of the house and into the wide open courtyard, but he still has a long way to go. Okay, Ethan's made some major progress, but let me jump in with a quick thought here. Now that he's safely outside, I'd strongly consider turning on the kitchen stove and lighting the whole house on fire. Not only would that torch any pesky mold creatures that might still be inside, but the blaze could also attract attention from society which would eventually lead to Ethan finally getting some backup once the police and fire department came to check it out. I sure as hell wouldn't want to go back in there anyway, and when you can't call for help, a good old fashioned smoke signal tends to do the trick. Out in the yard, Ethan finds a trailer where the only baker who's still sane, their daughter Zoe, had been living since the rest of the family went all cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Zoe herself is hiding somewhere else on the property, but she calls Ethan to explain that all of them, including Mia, are infected with a strange parasite. Yes, now listen carefully, Ethan. My family and I... Our bodies are contaminated. They'll all eventually turn into monsters unless they get the serum, but to find it, he'll have to venture into the old house. And that's Marguerite's turf. With that, Ethan reluctantly heads for the old house. There's no sign of Marguerite yet, but the place is creepy as hell, full of mutilated baby dolls and giant insects that attack Ethan if he gets too close. Searching the house for any sign of the serum, he eventually finds the parts to put together a homemade flamethrower, the perfect weapon for torching Marguerite's swarms of bugs. Back inside, Ethan comes face to face with Mother Marguerite for the first time when she jump scares him from behind a closed door and starts sending swarms of her insect children to devour his flesh. His bullets don't seem to do much against her either, forcing Ethan to take the same approach as he did with Jack and sneak around her through a secret passageway in the wall that's full of centipedes and other disgusting creepy crawlies, which leads him to the other side of the house. Okay, Ethan's officially fought the rest, but now it's time for him to fight the pest. He's finally had his first encounter with the bug-loving freak, Marguerite, and all that I can say is yikes. You see, Jack was scary in the Michael Myers sort of way, but Marguerite is the definition of heebie-jeebies. Well, Ethan's in too deep to give up now, so I guess it's time to talk some strategy. At first glance, Marguerite here looks like a frail old lady, which gives Ethan a much better chance of taking her in a fist fight, or else it would if it weren't for the fact that she also has superhuman strength and speed. 
This means that not only can she put Ethan through a wall, but she can run circles around Mr. Slowpoke too. The only good news is that she prefers to let her bugs do the fighting, and they're a lot easier to manage. So unless you have a severe case of entomophobia, just keep your distance and flamethrowering your way through her freaky flying friends, and that should be enough to get you by. When push does come to shove, Ethan is going to find out that although Marguerite also has the ability to regenerate, she's not quite as sturdy as Jack and can indeed be taken down with enough damage. Still, it's better to avoid confronting her for as long as possible, and just try to stay off her radar if you can. She actually does us a pretty big favor here by carrying around that lantern, because even when you can't see her, you can still see the light shining off of it, making it much easier to keep track of her movements. The most important thing right now is to get the serum, so I'd make searching for that my top priority, and try not to get into another fight as long as I could. Of course, if the situation gets too real and we decide that it's time to bail, we do have free reign of the property now. And I'm sure that we could still find a way out of there without Mia if we really wanted to. We'd still have to worry about whatever's out in the swamp at night, but it's an option if we ever decide that we've had enough of the Bakers and their house of horrors. Which could definitely happen after you see what Marguerite is about to transform into next. In a shed out back, Ethan eventually finds the key that he needs to access the second floor where the ingredients for the serum are hidden. But Marguerite cuts him off as soon as he approaches the door, throwing him down the staircase and through the damaged floorboards into a pit in the ground. Trapped, Ethan has no choice but to hit her with everything that he's got from down below. With enough damage, eventually Marguerite succumbs to her injuries and collapses into the pit, but she isn't out of the picture yet. Ethan quickly realizes that he'll need Marguerite's lantern to open the next door, but when he doubles back to get it, a long, slender arm pulls it away deeper into the crawl space. It looks like Marguerite has transformed into something even more horrifying. Still, Ethan follows her through the tunnels as she scuttles away on all fours, until he eventually comes to a ladder that drops him in front of a large greenhouse. Inside, Ethan pushes up to the second floor where he's suddenly ambushed through a window by Marguerite in her new spider-like form. It's a brutal fight to the death with Marguerite climbing all over the walls and ambushing Ethan from the shadows, like some demented spider lady from hell. Finally, he does enough damage to take her down permanently as the mold in her body calcifies, and she crumbles into dust, leaving her only lantern behind. With the lantern in hand, Ethan doubles back to the old house and makes his way to the terrifying contaminated area on the second floor, where he discovers a Frankenstein together child on an altar, taking its arm as an ingredient for the serum. When he turns around, he sees a vision of a pale, barefoot girl who suddenly disappears as he gets closer. Ethan doesn't realize it yet, but this girl is no ghost. She's something much, much worse. Ethan's supposed to be meeting Zoe back at the trailer, but when he finally gets there, the woman is nowhere to be found. Instead, he receives a phone call from her insane brother Lucas, who gleefully informs Ethan that he has both Mia and Zoe hostage. In order to find them, Ethan's going to have to play a game that Lucas designed just for him. First, Ethan heads to Lucas's bedroom from when he was a kid, and there's evidence that this guy was dangerously crazy long before the rest of the family started to lose it. Up in the attic, he finds another VHS tape labeled Happy Birthday, as well as a keycard that he'll need to move forward. This tape shows Lucas forcing one of the ghost hunters from earlier to complete a Saw-like game for his own amusement. The man ends up horrifically injuring himself in various ways until he finally solves the puzzle, only for the entire room to suddenly light on fire, burning him alive. Okay, we're officially down to our last baker, but he's the most twisted one of them all. I've watched enough of the Saw franchise to know that if somebody like this guy tells you that they want to play a game, it's never the good kind. So before we walk right into another trap, it's time to come up with a plan. So what do we know about Lucas so far? He's averagely built, and Ethan would probably be able to handle him if it weren't for his powers. But he doesn't seem like the type of guy who fights fair. Remember back at the diner when he got his arm cut off? He sure seems to be doing all right now, which means that it won't be easy to take him down if we do have to fight. So just like the others, it's better for us to try and avoid him. 
Now, based on the notes that we found in his room about robotics and inventing, the happy birthday tape, and all of this game talk, I'd say that it's safe to expect a lot of traps coming our way. We need to pay close attention to the details of every room that we have to pass through from now on, because you never know when a seemingly safe door or hallway could be hiding a deadly booby trap. From what we saw on the tape, we should always expect all of his puzzles to have a deadly twist. Playing along will only get you killed, so we need to think over everything very carefully and try to find some creative ways to outsmart him instead of playing by his rules. Ethan's taken down two of the bakers now, so Lucas here shouldn't be much trouble as long as he's careful. That ain't special. This, this right here. Special. Remember though, we can always hop the fence and bail at any time, and I'd keep that idea in my back pocket just in case I got the feeling that this was a game that I couldn't win. Ethan enters the next building, chasing after Lucas, but the only thing there is a TV screen in an otherwise empty room that's lit up with party lights like some kind of sick joke. It's a message from Lucas. Not only does he have the girls, but he also has the rest of the ingredients that they need to finish the serum, which means that if Ethan wants to save his wife, then he's going to have to play along. Eventually, he winds up in a large barn where the family used to keep their farm animals. Lucas forces him to fight against this new, massive, molded variant in an area that he's created, complete with rock music blasting through the speakers, but Ethan is easily able to take it out with the powerful new gear that he's been collecting. Defeating the monster unlocks the door to the next room where Ethan finds the last victim's charred body with a note warning him that you're next. He ends up trapped by Lucas in the same deadly puzzle but what this asshole doesn't realize is that Ethan already knows the twist from watching the VHS tape. So he's able to avoid being killed in the fire. Furious, Lucas drops in a ticking time bomb to kill him instead, but just before it blows up, Ethan tosses it through a hole in the wall, opening a way out. He makes it to Lucas's control room just as the creep disappears, but now he has what he needs to finish the serum. Crossing a long boardwalk, Ethan finally finds Mia and Zoe tied up near the boathouse. Now that they have all of the necessary ingredients, Zoe is able to make two batches of the serum, just enough for her and Mia to both get a dose. But the bakers aren't done with Ethan yet. Suddenly, they're attacked by everyone's favorite cannibal, Big Daddy Jack. But he's looking a bit different from the last time that they met. With the mold fully taking over, he's been transformed into an enormous two-story tall monstrosity, leaving Ethan with no choice but to inject him with the serum, calcifying Jack into a frozen statue. But there's only one dose of the serum left. Without enough of the juice to go around, Ethan makes the decision to cure Mia, leaving Zoe for dead as they sail off into the swamp on a small raft. It looks like they're finally free of the Baker House, but the truth is that it's not over yet. Okay, man, that was a tough call. After all, Zoe did actually help us out, while Mia here was busy trying to cut our heads off half the time. Maybe it could have been possible to give them each half a dose since neither of them are as far gone as Jack. It'd be better than nothing, but then again, with only one dose, that's pretty risky if it doesn't work out. You could end up not curing either of them, so it's probably better not to take the gamble. Honestly, I'd think that I'd have to choose the wife here too, since she's the one who we came all this way to save in the first place. If we've learned one thing tonight, it's that every time that they're close to getting out, something terrible is about to happen. So if I were Ethan, I'd kick that little raft into high gear and speed out of there while they still have the chance. As they're cruising through the swamp, Ethan is surprised to see a massive cargo ship off in the distance. Suddenly, they're attacked by the mold, sinking the boat and knocking them both into the water. Mia takes over as she regains consciousness washed up near the ship, finding Ethan just as he's taken deeper into the wreckage by the sentient mold. As she searches for him, she continues seeing visions of the creepy little girl from back at the house. And that's when we find out how she really ended up here in the first place. It turns out that Mia here knows more about what's been going on than even the bakers themselves. The little girl, Eveline, was actually some kind of top secret bioweapon created by Mia's employers, a criminal organization known only as The Connections. Mia's job was to babysit the girl while she was covertly transported aboard the ship, with orders to destroy Eveline if the operation went south. Tired of being treated like a lab rat, the girl managed to escape and look over the ship with her mold, turning the unsuspecting crew into monsters and declaring Mia to be her new mommy. 
Despite Mia's best attempts to stop her, Eveline crashed the ship and dragged her off to the Baker House, which is how she ended up taking over the family. As part of the job, Mia actually received special ops training, making her pretty handy with all kinds of weapons, which she uses to carve her way through the monsters that are still infesting the now destroyed ship. Determined to rescue her man, Mia fights her way down deeper and deeper into the wreckage, until she finally reaches the engine room where she finds Ethan covered up by a bunch of mold. While unconscious, Ethan has a dream where he meets Jack and Zoe, but instead of the crazed axe murderer that we've come to expect, this time Jack is actually super chill. The man regretfully explains that this was all caused by Eveline, who made the entire family, besides Lucas, turn homicidal when she infected them with the mold after they rescued her and Mia from the crashed ship. They never wanted to become so evil, but once Eveline took hold, they were powerless to resist her control. Finding Eve and taking her out is the only way to finally end this nightmare and set Jack's family and Mia free. Suddenly, Ethan wakes up as Mia finally breaks him out, but she's forced to lock herself inside the engine room as she starts to fall under Eve's mind control yet again. Well, Ethan didn't kill his wife twice just to let her die now, so he returns to the house armed with an arsenal of weapons, knowing what he has to do to finish the job. The path leads him back through the swamp to a sprawling salt mine that's become infested with dozens of the molded. But now that Ethan's armed to the teeth, even the toughest monsters are light work. Deep underground, he finds a secret workshop where the connections were keeping tabs on Eve, and the notes indicate that she was rapidly aging. Another document explains that the infected start out with the ability to regenerate from massive damage and then begin to see visions of the girl, before the final stage when they go completely mold mode. Based on this, Ethan seems to be in the mid stages of the infection himself, which explains how his left arm still works. As luck would have it, he's also able to synthesize a third dose of the serum, which he's going to need very soon. Okay, we've got the serum and we've got a plan. All that Ethan needs to do now is get close enough to Eve to hit her with a dose. But that's not going to be easy if she knows that you're coming. Instead of confronting her head on, it could be possible to use the girl's psychology against her and trick Eve by just agreeing to be her family like she wants before getting close enough to finish the job. That's one way to do it, or Ethan could always use the serum on himself and just leave while he has the chance. Let's be honest here, Mia kind of sucks now anyway, especially now that we know that she played a huge role in everything that happened. If it wasn't for her shady company making mold children, then Ethan would be back home chilling right now instead of getting his ass kicked up and down the block by a zombie redneck torture family. After learning all of that, I might just pack my bags and let the connections clean up their own mess. Back in the guest house, Ethan finally corners Eveline up in the attic and injects her with the serum. The girl screams out in fear, and as the vision breaks, he sees that she was really Grandma Baker the whole time. Crying in pain, Eveline starts to transform as the mold takes over, mutating into a giant head that engulfs the entire room. Ethan does the only thing that you can do in a situation like this and starts blasting, until Eveline decides that she's had enough and flings him out into the front yard. When Ethan regains consciousness, Eveline has transformed again into an enormous mold monster 10 stories tall. And there's nothing in his arsenal that could kill a creature this huge. Luckily for Ethan and the world, a military helicopter flies overhead at that exact moment, dropping him an extremely powerful weapon loaded with special rounds that he uses to finally put Eve down for good. The chopper circles back around as a team of special ops soldiers rappel down and one of them introduces himself to Ian as Chris Redfield, a guy who's been around the block when it comes to fighting bioweapons. They airlift Ethan and Mia out of there, and both of them are glad just to be alive, but it's safe to say that she's going to have a lot of explaining to do. They've finally escaped the madhouse and set the bakers free, but this won't be the last time that their lives turn into an absolute nightmare. Holy f***ing sh**. That was a lot, and to experience it all in first person made it even more intense. What did you guys think? That was our first video game themed episode. I need to know if y'all were rocking with it because we might make more if you f with it. Now me personally, I would have said f all that sh and got a new girlfriend, but you know, simp, simpity, simp, 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 simpin is as simpin does, right? Ethan probably really loved Mia. I mean, I'm three years, 
halfway across the country, no police activity, let's f***ing go. Let us know down in the comments below what you would have done differently though. And thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out that How To Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. And seriously, let us know if you guys are f***ing with the video game concept. Think of how many horror video games are out there that we could do. I'll catch you guys on the next one. Have a damn good day.